and uh, I'm pleased to announce our first speaker today, Ulf Leona uh, from Weizmann Institute, uh, who was uh, one of the first people who started to pursue the topic of invisibility clocks, if you know what, what is that, that's connected to metamaterials, and he is studying actually optics of nanostructured media, optics of metamaterials, and the first talk is about the art of invisibility. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you very much for your patience. We had to sort out some computer problems before uh, I could start. Uh, so I'm talking about the science of invisibility in this lecture, and what is invisibility? So first, it, it's a subject that comes from this part of the world. So it's a subject of illusions and deceptions and things you see in a strange environment, like in the, uh, in the desert over there. And it's an optical illusion like a mirage. So sometimes when you are out in the, in the desert, you see that uh, you see mirror images. So you see uh, a reflection of the sky in the, in the air, and that is an optical illusion. It's, an, it's a mirage. And now, this illusion happens because the hot air above the sand is able to bend light. So it's bending light that comes from the sky, and then it's reflected and reaches your eye. And this is the the reason for all optical illusion, it's simply bending of light, that light doesn't go uh, along a straight path. The simplest example is the one you see here on the, on the screen, and that is um, the, if you look into uh, water, then, um, for example, at the fish in the water, then you see the fish at a different position than where it actually is. The reason for that is that light rays that come from the objects, uh, that carry the image of the objects, they are not traveling along a straight path, they are refracted at the interface between water and air, and you, on the other hand, you assume that the light rays that strike your eyes, that they always propagate along the straight path, and therefore, for you, the fish is at a different position than where it actually is. So that is an example of an optic illusion, and it's caused by the bending of light. Here it's the most extreme example, so it's refraction, so it's a sudden change of direction. But you can imagine if you have a material where the optical properties, the refractive index varies gradually, then this refraction goes also uh, in, a, in a gradual way, and so light is in gradual bend around an object. So therefore you see things differently. So optical media, optical materials change the perception of, uh, of space. Now, the ultimate illusion is perhaps to make things completely invisible. So here at the mirage, you see that there's something going on. So this is an unnatural phenomenon. You see that uh, you see objects where they don't belong. But invisibility is to make things completely disappear, so that's perhaps what that constitutes the ultimate optical illusion. Now, the science of invisibility is fairly recent. So these are the first papers related with this subject, and if you look, what is interesting about them, so they, they appear roughly at the same time. So this was the earliest, this is 2003, and then you see there's one precursor in 2005, then there are two papers in 2006. So around that time, the first scientific publications on invisibility uh, appeared, and uh, it took also some effort to actually publish in this field because it was there was no there was nothing there before. Everything before the literature before that was uh, really. Clicker works, so was this literature, films, myths. This is what existed before that time. And you can classify the the literature in this field before and after, roughly in, according to two two different subjects. One is the invisible man and the other one is the invisible woman. So the uh, the invisible man is a figure from a novel by Herbert Wells, and in this novel he's a chemist who invents a substance that changes 
his refractive index. What he does, he makes his body transparent by giving it the same refractive index as its environment. Light does not care about what the particular material is, it only cares about the refractive index. So if you happen to have the same refractive index as your environment, then to light you are the same as your environment, so light just goes through you and therefore you disappear from view. It makes you completely transparent. This is not a good idea, uh, because you need to change yourself in order to make this happen. And also, if you read the novel, it doesn't end well for the, for the lead character of that novel either. Now, the second possibility of invisibility is uh, personified by the invisible woman. What she does in the Fantastic Four, so a cartoon and uh, also a film, she has some sort of force field from outer space with which she can bend uh, space. And in doing so, she can send light around her, and then this light doesn't touch her, and therefore she becomes invisible. And if you send light around in the proper way so that it uh, moves in the same direction where it came from, then you wouldn't be able to see that something has happened. And so this is a way of making herself invisible. And this, as it turns out, is a more practical way than uh, invisibility, than the method by the invisible man, although in the scientific literature, there are also proposals related to the invisible and sophisticated ways of making things invisible uh, that are similar to, to that. Now, I started investigating this problem around 2002 and thinking about what, what you can do with a dielectric material where you change the refractive index gradually. As, you said, as I said, there the, refract, the uh, light rays can be banned in a gradual fashion. So the idea was simply that suppose you have some material and then light rays from the distance, they are uh, gradually banned by the material and in such a way that when they leave, they go in the same direction as where they came from. And they go around an interior region in the middle that is not touched by light and therefore it becomes completely invisible. Moreover, because they leave the device in the same direction they came from, you would not notice that something has happened to these light rays and therefore for you this would be, uh, nothing had happened so that you wouldn't see that anything was not to be seen there. And so this is invisibility. The problem is, so the advantage of, first, the advantage of dielectric materials is that you can in principle do this. So, the invisible woman from the Fantastic Four, she has some sort of force field. You don't need that. So you can achieve the same effect with materials, dielectric materials that have a, a designed refractive index. The problem is, how do you find the right distribution of refractive indexes? So how do you design this? It's not a problem if you want to make something invisible from one direction. That's easy to design. You can do it in this way. Or you can also use some mirrors and things have, people have done this. The problem is, how do you design invisibility from many, from a range of directions or from all directions? And the inspiration to solve <coughs> these problems comes from a different area of physics. It comes from the physics of space, and astrophysics, general relativity. And it comes from a connection between geometries, and materials. So in general relativity, you also have this phenomenon of light bending. In fact, this was one of the early tests of uh, relativity by, observed by Eddington. That is, that the image of stars appeared to have changed during the solar eclipse. The point was that the sun was, <coughs> was uh, deflecting or was bending the light rays coming from the distant stars, and therefore, in that projection, they appear to have moved slightly outward. Now, you can do exactly the same with a refractive index distribution. So you can just easily, actually in fact, design a material that has the same effect as the gravitational field of a star like the, like the sun. So in general, there is a connection between materials and geometries, and in its best form, it's expressed as it's shown here, as a connection between Einstein and Maxwell. 
the connection is this, so that Maxwell's equations, as, as you know them, they are valid in arbitrary geometries and in arbitrary coordinates, if the only thing you have to change are the constitutive equations. By Maxwell's equations, I mean the equations that, that uh, contain all the four fields. So they contain the electric field E, the magnetic induction uh, D, uh, B, the displacement <coughs> D, and uh, the magnetic field strength uh, H. And what, what the geometry does, it changes the constitutive equation. So it changes the connection between the dielectric displacement and the electric field or the magnetic field uh, reduction and the magnetic field strength. So this is where a geometry, uh, where the geometry appears. Now you can turn this the other way around. You can say if I want to create some geometry that correspond, for example, to the deflection of starlight in the previous pictures, then what I need to do is I take the expressions that come from geometry and I implement them with dielectric materials. So I take an epsilon and a mu with exactly the properties that I need in order to, to make this happen. So that's the way how you can design geometries using um, dielectrics. And I want to show you one example <coughs> of unusual physical or optical phenomena that you can get with it, not invisibility yet, but on the way to invisibility. So this is the example essentially with, with which I started from. So you look into water, into a fish, or let's assume that you have well, some point particle in the water and that is sending out light in all directions. Let's show here these red lights, they are the, the light rays going out of the water. And then what happens is they're refracted at the interface between water and air. Some are totally internally reflected, so the angle is uh, shallow enough to the, to the surface. Others, they, they can get out of it, but you see that they are going in a range of directions and in a range of reflection angles when you leave them. So this means, oops, this is too fast. Uh, this means if you look, that is, if you trace back where these rays uh, come from, so if you assume that you're seeing in straight lines, then you see that the image of this point varies. And it varies with the angle in which you look at it. That's something you can easily observe. If you, if you look into an aquarium, then typically what you see is so the object inside, like fish in an aquarium, they appear at a different position than where they actually are, but also this position changes. If you move around, you see it again at a different position, and so on and so forth. So that means that, you, that the optical illusion created by the material is easily called off as an illusion, because this cannot really happen in reality. So, you see that uh, something, something fishy is, is going on here. Now, let's take this example. So this is essentially almost the same thing, except that this is a material that, where the effective index varies gradually, and therefore the light rays are also bent in a gradient <coughs> fashion. They originate from one point in, in this example as well. Now, let's take the same exercise. So you trace back all these light rays, and now you see miraculously that they meet at one point. That means if you have a material like this, then the image of your object is always at the same position, regardless from where you where you look. So this is really a perfect illusion, so that the the, the picture does not change and yet, um, from does not depend on the point of view, and hence you would not be able to tell easily whether this is an illusion or whether this is reality. Now, let's go one step further. So, what you can say is this. So, you see that you can discriminate between two spaces. So, one is physical reality. So, this is what light rays really do. So, they are banned. And the other one is the space that you actually see. So, let's call this virtual optical space. And it's, this space is created by tracing back all the light rays to the point from which they appear to have uh, originated. Now, because it's really one point is mapped into one point, <coughs> you can dispense of the procedure. So it's not important how these points are obtained. What is important is that there is one point in physical space that has a well-defined image point in virtual space. And you can do this with all points. So what you can is that this material performs a transformation of space, a coordinate transformation of space. This is an idea that is very much um, <coughs> perpetrated in general relativity. So, coordinate transformation. 
That is a method to create unusual optical illusions. And this is what I proposed in 2006. So that a coordinate transformation as the basic tool for making things invisible. In that case, it is actually a special coordinate transformation. It's a conformal transformation that does not change the angle between your coordinate lines. And it has the advantage that it can be implemented with an isotropic refractive index distribution. And uh, so that, therefore, it's close to what people normally can manufacture in the, in the laboratory or even what na natural materials have. The problem with this is that you need some extra tricks. So you can show that with only conformal transformation, invisibility is impossible, and you need to uh, do some further manipulations that uh, are required in order to make things disappear. Therefore, it took me some time to figure this out. Now, there is another method, and that's conceptually much simpler, where you only do a coordinate transformation, but then it is an anisotropic material that is required because, as you see from this picture, the angles between the coordinate lines are no longer preserved. So we have physical space, we have virtual space, and there the coordinate lines are there under different angles. Now, this is the, it's the conceptual simplest because um, of the following reason. So that this is how here in that case invisibility works. So you have in real space, we have objects like these fish shown over there. And in virtual space, this is the space of the optical illusion. What happens is that you take the interior of the blue area in the picture, so including the blue fish, and you project it into a single point in virtual space. This means essentially you demagnify objects. So you make them appear to, have to be of infinitely small size. If the size is infinitely small, it's invisible, and therefore everything inside of uh, the, the blue region has become visible. And you can do this in a finite region of space. So this finite region is indicated by the light blue circle in the picture. This gives you the dimensions of your device. And then the blue circle is the inner dimension of the device. So this is a cloaking device, a thick shell that uh, transforms space around it. And so this is, it's a map of real space to virtual space. Virtual space is the space you see. And therefore, in this space, you have just one point representing the object, and that point is invisible. So therefore, uh, it makes things disappear. <coughs> Objects in the shell themselves are slightly distorted. You see that the uh, shape of the fish is slightly changed in that shell as well. But outside of it, nothing, of course, would be, would be changed. Now, you can ask how does that correspond to the picture of the bending of light rays? And that's very easy to answer. You see this in, the, uh, in these diagrams. The left diagram, as usual, shows virtual space, the right uh, real space. You see that a light ray is a straight line in virtual space, and you can put it on one of the coordinate lines. Now, in real space, because you perform a coordinate transformation, uh, this coordinate line is no longer a straight line. It's distorted. It goes around the object. And so therefore, you see that this picture of sending light around the object is naturally implemented with coordinate transformations. Now, the procedure is then this, so you write down what the corresponding metric tensor of the coordinate transformation is. You put this into this equation, you get an epsilon, you get a mu, and then uh, this in principle gives you the recipe of making an uh, invis invisibility device. The problem is, how do you do this in practice? So if you want to impress your friends at the, at the patent office, in the old days you had to go to the patent office, then uh, what do you do? And the problem is because for those transformations of space, you need extreme properties of materials. And there, uh, one of the possibilities is to use what is known as structured composite materials or meta materials. And here's an example <coughs> from, of an invisibility device. It's an invisibility device for microwaves. It's very hard to do this in optics. I will show you an example of what can actually be done in optics. For microwaves, it's easier. And 
One of the reasons is because you can engineer materials uh, much easier for microwaves than you can do in optics, and you create structured materials. This is a very, very simple recipe here. It's made of circuit board. So you take a typical circuit board, which is plastic with a uh, copper layer on it, and you etch structures in it, and these are these uh, split ring resonators that are etched in the, in the copper. Now, to an electrical engineer, they would look like um, electrical uh, resonators, simply because what you see, you see it looks like a capacitor, that's uh, what you have in the middle. Then you have some bands, they act as uh, inductors, so you have a combination of capacitance and inductance, that gives you resonance, and if you change the capacitance, you change the resonance frequencies, and so therefore you can tune the, the response of that resonator very easily, simply by giving it different shapes. And that's what was done in, uh, in this particular experiment, where uh, the, <coughs> the conductance was changed from one layer to another in such a way that it corresponds to the bending of microwaves around the object. Now, this is something one can do with microwaves and optics. This is very, very hard. What is done in most experiments in optics is not full invisibility, but something rather like this. So it's optical flattening. So what you can do is you can make a round object to appear flat, like in physical space you have another fissure, Fugu, and you can make it appear as flat as a, as a flat fish by a transformation. And this is a transformation that is easier to implement in practice. It doesn't require extreme properties of the uh, material anymore. Moreover, it can also be do with, it can also be done with isotropic materials. It's shown in the example down there. So you can, in principle, do this with a conformal transformation or quasi-conformal transformation. And therefore, this is something that is close to practice, and uh, and therefore most of the experiments are of this type. So I want to show you one of those experiments. This is a lab in Birmingham where uh, these two gentlemen will show you how to make things invisible. What they make invisible is a paper clip. So it also shows you how modest the attempts are in, in invisibility, at least for the visible rate of the spectrum. So this is the object to be made invisible, or to be precise, to be made completely flat. So you see two prisms here. So the transparent <coughs> prism in front of it, this is calcite. It's a biophilic <coughs> material, and it's cut in a, in, in a precise way required for the transformation that uh, is performed. Then the golden prism in the back, simply there, the front end is the only decisive part, it acts as a mirror. So this is a diagram what uh, what is happening. So you have a mirror, then a paper clip in front of this mirror, and then this calcite cloak or calcite structure, if you like, in front of everything. What they're going to show is how this looks like an image. So they take a panda and uh, then look at this panda, so they look at the light that comes from the panda, and then they have to use a polarizer, because the calcite is biofringent, so it, it depends on the polarization, uh, what refractive index you have, and it will only work for one of the polarizations, and so if you put the polarizer right, then you should see the paper clip appear uh, completely flat, so as part of the mirror, so you shouldn't see it anymore. However, if you use the wrong polarization, then you will, of course, see a distortion caused on the image shadow of the of the paper plate. So this is what you see. So this is the lookout for the polarizer. You see the panda on the side, and then uh, again, this is how it looks. So this is the wrong polarization there, and then if you put the polarizer right, you see that uh, the image of the panda appears. So the paper clip has been transformed, has been made as part of the mirror. So this is what you can achieve in practice now. So you can make objects appear flat of a size of a few centimeters. What limits this is simply, it's the crystals you can get. So they got some very good crystals from China to, to make this happen. If you would have larger crystals, you can do it. That's what people have achieved so far in, in terms of optical invisibility for microscopic objects. Now I want slightly to change gears. So I want to show you that uh, this idea of invisibility by transforming space or transforming space in general has wider applications. I was very pleased to see this, so how that uh, field has caught on and how it made it into different areas of physics. 
So one other application is thermal cloaking. So you may need it at these temperatures, but this is not what the picture actually shows. It's this. So it's a cloaking device uh, that cloaks uh, thermal conductivity. So this is the experiment that's done. So it's very simple. So you have uh, <coughs> hot water and cold water, and you look at the conduction, uh, at the heat conduction through a copper lead between the hot and the cold part. And the goal is to make essentially the, the that, that you could put something inside of it, make it disappear according to heat conduction. So this is not thermal cloaking in a sense that you protect yourself uh, from uh, cold in that uh, case or that you're losing heat to the environment. And this is not thermal insulation, it's thermal cloaking. So, and it really is based on the analogy between optics and thermodynamics. So what you see in optics is we have propagation of wave and thermodynamics we have a heat transport, and heat transport is a diffusive process. So it's not exactly the same as in optics. There's no wave phenomenon associated with that. Now, <clears throat> if you have insulation in optics, so in optics you could also make yourself very easily invisible simply by screening yourself. So you put something around yourself, you would not be visible. But of course, everyone would see that there's something to be seen there. And so if you take students like this, so you, you uh, enclose some metal, for example, around an object, a uh, desirable object with money, for example, then uh, what you get is, you get reflections all over the place. And in thermodynamics, so thermal insulation is the same. So you, you insulate an object, and then you would see that the conduction of heat is, of course, changed by the thermal insulation. Now, the point of thermal cloaking is to avoid that, so that the heat conduction is really goes on as if there were standard uniform material, you would not be able to see that uh, flow of heat is altered. So that's what they have shown in the experiments of these are experimental data. Another example that is also related to diffusion. So suppose this is your bathroom, and you live on the first floor, and naturally, you would like to protect your bathroom against burglar leaves. So what you do is you put some bars in, in your bathroom uh, window to the outside wall. This doesn't really look nice, uh, does it? So uh, it makes you feel like you're, you're, you're in a prison. So it might be desirable to get rid of those bars, at least in its image. So the, the question is, can you remove those bars from, from the picture? And yes, you can. And you can do this in a similar way as the modification of the conduction of, of heat. And in fact, this is relatively easy to implement in practice. So the, what, you, what you do have here is also a diffusive process. So in the bathroom window, light does not simply go through, but light is diffused. So it's scattered many, many times in the internal structure. So there are some. Uh, <clears throat> some droplets or some uh, colloidal structure inside, and so light is reflected many times and it's diffused through the structure. And what they have done is they have designed, with just a few layers, a material that is able to then send diffused light around the object. So this is how, how it looks like in, uh, in reality. And these pictures, they make a comparison. So you have, as you see here, there's some Aquarium, it's filled with uh, a water paint solution in that experiment, or you could also leave the aquarium empty. And so the left picture shows that you just have an empty aquarium, the right picture you have water paint solution in the aquarium. So the first one is there's nothing there, so you see the no object, and then you put the rod inside, and then you see in there, of course, the shadow of that rod. But also in the water paint solution, you see that there something was there. That's what you have seen in the, in the bathroom windows. Now, if you put then this cloaking structure around this, and just a few layers, and I don't remember exactly what materials they were using. It was something very simple. And uh, so, if you if you put this around, then in air, it would just make your object appear slightly thicker because you have some more structure in it on it. But in the water paint solution, you clearly see that uh, the, uh, the object or its image has, has disappeared. 
And so you can make your bathroom windows look decent. You may say, well, this is just a gadget. So this is, this is uh, not a real problem. The real issue is there are situations in technology where this is important. And this, for example, in, in solar technology. So if you have, if you have a solar panel, then in order to uh, get the produced electricity from it, you need, you need to put some wires on the, on the solar panel. So each solar cell produces a certain voltage, and you want to add up all those voltages, and you want to then lead the current out of it. And this needs to be done with wires, and these wires have a shadow. If you are able to reduce the shadow of the wires, you can increase the efficiency of a solar cell by a few percent. You may say, is that important, a few percent? Yes, it is. So every percent counts in, in, this, in, in this business, and therefore this is really an important improvement of what set of solar cells can do. Another example. So we talked about diffusive diffusion instead of wave propagation. Let's go to a different part of the world, and that is the sea. So what are what kind of problems do you encounter in the sea? And the problem in the sea is that uh, it looks like this. So if you, are, if you are down there, then this is what you see. Therefore, animals who live in the sea, they don't use sight for orientation or finding their prey, they use sound. And the most impressive one are the sperm whales. So they have and in their head, they produce direction, directional sound, and they uh, they then can also record. Uh, they can hear the echo from the sound waves, and in this way, they can find their way in the deep ocean. They can find their prey in the deep ocean, so they can live there. There are other creatures as well that use sound. These sort of uh, technological things that are also relying on on sonar to find their way, and also they try to avoid. Uh, detection using solar. So therefore this is a this is a natural issue to look into the propagation of sound. And here is an example, this is the first experiment that was published in this field of the modification of sound waves using a cloaking structure. You see this is a very small structure, it's nowhere comparable to the size of a submarine. And uh, they put this into a small uh, container of water some object inside, so a star that uh, would scatter sound waves, and then if you take the image using a hydrophone, you see the, uh, the shadow of the distorted sound waves. On the other hand, if you put this metal structure around the star-shaped object, then you see that the sound waves are nearly perfectly uh, preserved, and hence with a hydrophone you would not see a difference. So therefore, if you have some object that you want to hide according, uh, from sound waves, you could do something similar to this, so you could cloak it with an appropriate acoustical structure and then it becomes um, invisible to some, inaudible to sound waves. <coughs> well, uh, why stop at sound? There are other waves in nature, and the most impressive one are the waves from earthquakes. So this is, the earthquake is nothing, just a wave, and uh, the most destructive waves of, of earthquakes are actually waves that run on the surface of the, of the earth. The trouble with earthquakes is that that's what they do. So they have quite a large intensity and they can destroy things. So you may wonder, it might be desirable if your house is in an area that is prone to earthquakes, that you want to protect it against those waves. So when an earthquakes come, you want to send off the earthquake uh, in a different direction, preferably to the house of your neighbor, for example. And um, can you do this in principle? And as weird as it sounds, so there are experiments that try to show that this is possible in principle. Here is one. And they did this in a parking lot in the French Alps. And they did this as follows. So they, what's, what this experiment should show is a deflection of waves comparable with the waves of earthquakes, and it's not the cloaking of waves so that they go around an object and uh, don't, uh, don't touch it and, and propagate as if they, they started before. It's simply a reflection of, of, of those waves. And for this, they drilled holes in the ground. These holes, they create a destructive interference of those waves, and so therefore they can send a track. They act like a mirror for, for waves comparable with earthquakes. So this is what you would like to put in front of your house. 
and there are certain holes drilled into the ground. And then the layer behind this, these are holes that contain seismometers. So they want to detect what actually goes through. So they put their instruments <coughs> everywhere. And then the digger you see in front, this was the digger used to, to drill the holes. But it's also the digger that makes the waves. So they, uh, they use it to create the, the waves, 15 hertz. And then they record what, uh, what was there. They put the fact proof that it's possible to manipulate those waves. The next part of this experiment that they really want to use explosives. So they want to create a, a strong wave and then see whether such waves are actually reflected in, uh, or it's possible to reflect such waves from uh, there. And you can do other things as well. So you can go into acoustics and do it also for acoustical, nice acoustical uh, <coughs> manipulations of pleasant sound waves that you would like to hear. Right, so this is our, some examples from the science of invisibility, what drives and also what limits this field is essentially it's the ability to imagine. So what you can do with unusual connections between different areas of physics, following very much the saying of, of Einstein that imagination is more important than knowledge, because knowledge is always limited. There is with imagination, you can embrace the entire world of all that ever will be to know and, and understand. And with this, I would like to end, in particular with a transformation of the two heroes of the story, Einstein and Maxwell, into each other, which is also an example of a coordinate transformation. Thank you very much. Question, please. So, can we move to the first slide, please? Yes. To the first slide? Yes. Okay, so let's see whether the computer can move. It's yes. invisible man and invisible woman. Okay. Yes. space in some other kind, but invisible man for sure is blind, because he doesn't perceive any photons of light which pass through him. Okay. And uh, invisible woman may bend all the photons around her, so she isn't, uh, is, is in the dark too. For you are raising an interesting question. May I send this question to the audience? So the question is, suppose you're wearing some invisibility de device, so some layer that sends light around you, would you be able to see something? So who thinks that uh, you would be blind? And okay. I think there are ways around it. Why? I think there are ways around it. You, you think don't have to be you blind. You can see something. Yeah, yeah I, I think. Yeah. Is there anybody else who thinks that uh, one can see something? Not really. So let's go. To the signs of it. So and that is this picture here. So what does the cloaking device do? So it makes yourself appear to somebody else the size of a single point, right? That's what it that's what it does. Yeah? So the question is rather, can a single point see something? What do you think? Uh, it can, uh, can't because uh, the flux of uh, light from all sides will be near to zero because uh, the intensity stays the same, but the surface area but is then, much smaller. But take, take a single atom. So a single atom is very much like a single point, and you can see single atoms. You see them if they're resonant. Yes, but they see with uh, some quantum flux. They uh, have very big noise in them. I disagree. So, uh, so you could. They, it's true. So, when you come to atoms, then quantum mechanics is, is is important. And so, the details of how atoms perceive light, are, of course, they are governed by quantum mechanics, but not the, the principal mechanism. So, you could also imagine a classical 
near point like antenna and that would act like that. And it would be able to see, perceive the, uh, the electromagnetic field as the, as the atom does. However, what the atom cannot see, it cannot see images, right? It cannot see from which direction the light comes from. For this you need two arcs, so two atoms. And then you would be able to, to do that as well. Also, as properly shown on this picture, uh, while one fish is hidden, the other fish is distorted. So, the uh, invisibility clock of this sort is not really fully invisibility clock. No, no, no. This is, because, uh, uh, it's not true. So, the, the other fish is simply, this, it's one that, that is in the, in the shell of the device. Of course, you don't want to have any fish there. So, it should be <laughs> transparent, uh, completely transparent. This is simply to indicate that there you do a transformation. So if you happen to have it, uh, something there, then of course it's going to be distorted. Yes. So in reality, in reality means in, like in the experiment, these calcite crystals, they should be as perfect as possible, as transparent as possible. You have nothing there, and therefore uh, you you don't see that they actually inside of themselves distort the uh, space. Also, another large problem for invisibility box of uh, this nature is chromatism, because uh, each uh, different uh, uh, wavelength of light will be different, uh, uh, differently in real materials. <coughs> this is this is a big, very big. This is actually the decisive problem for for, for invisibility, and which makes it impossible really to uh, oops, to appear in practice. Now let me. Yes, the video doesn't stop, so let me try to just be a little bit patient. I want to show you the last picture of the of the video. So the, there you see exactly the, what what you what you said. So the chromatism. So this is now the the shadow of the paper that disappears. You see a few fringes. This is it's visible light, and it's a relatively broad band of the spectrum. You see some artifacts. So you saw that it's not entirely perfect, and there are some some artifacts uh, due to there, but in principle for, for transformations that appear to flatten objects, this is not as crucial. So you, can, you can do that in principle over uh, some range of the spectrum and therefore get a reasonable approximation to, to an optical illusion. So for example, if you take uh, the short wave one, uh, is it really ap applicable to real-life situations? For example, can we clock a real-life plane with it? Because uh, real-life radars, uh, they can tune the frequency in some very narrow range. Can we cover all of this narrow range with uh, a single sheet of material? So one, one thing, so, so the, the perfect look <coughs> is to make the plane appear like a single point. This you can only do for discrete set of frequencies, or for one frequency, and strictly speaking. What else you can do, so how well you can approximate the things, I have no idea and I don't want to know. So, uh, this is not the field of research I'm going to enter. So, uh, so uh, <laughs> yeah. you can apply some questions a bit later. What do you mean by hidden? So, for uh, electromagnetic waves, light, light, or acoustic visible object. Light. Sorry, for visible light. For visible light. I think what I showed you is the largest that people have achieved in this in the flattened uh, picture. There, there are other ways. So you can, if you if you know that you're looking in one direction, then you can. There are, there are nice videos on the internet actually. So that you can make people disappear. So it's a size of people, but you have to know that uh, you're looking at some person like in the end of a corridor. So you're essentially looking only in one direction. Then you can make the person completely disappear using this, this, uh, this kind of techniques. And you can do this with mirrors. So a simple arrangement of mirrors is enough to achieve that effect in, in one direction. There, of course, there are other ways of making things invisible. So you, the synthesis, you simply you record an, an image with a, with a camera and you project that image onto the, the person. These sorts of things have been done as well. And, and then it's person size, uh, what, you, what you can achieve, or even larger. 
think there are plans in South Korea to make a skyscraper visible by recording the image from the, the other side and then having using LEDs to project it on, on one side of the, of the skyscraper. Whether that is a good idea, I doubt very much because you want to make a skyscraper visible, particularly if it's close to an airport. Uh, but uh, that's that's what I what I read uh, our plans there. Yeah. Uh, so about the bathroom. Yes. If I um, if I want to make my bars invisible from the inside. Maybe it's a good idea to keep them still visible from the outside, because otherwise they won't work, right? Yes. Can one do that? Well, they would work, but uh, they wouldn't deter the thieves. Yeah, so you'll have to replace your window every day. This is, a, <laughs> this is a tricky question. So the question is, can you... So in... This is, it's about reciprocity. Uh, reciprocity. Well, so, yes. Typically, so in... Like an electromagnetism or optics, materials are uh, reciprocal in the sense that when they go from A to B, they can also go from B to A along the same path. There are materials where that's not the case. So where they, where uh, the objects on the way back, or the, the let's say light on the way back, moves can move on different paths. I'm not sure whether this is possible for diffusion. So can you can no you have way. diffusion and I'm not sure. No so, way, I mean, it's Laplace equation and it has a symmetry which is R to the whole. Yeah, yeah, of course, but uh, if it's you don't have Laplace equation, so right. you may have uh, like diffusion in some anisotropic material or some, so I'm not sure. So this is a, it's a, it's an interesting question, <coughs> whether diffusion can in principle be made non result Maybe using a typical polarization and making it, making it um, one way. Exactly. Yeah, then it will only work for the both burglar with the polar rest. That might help already. If the burglar has the appropriate sunglasses, then yeah. we would deter it. Well, you can only outcome in light from your bathroom make polarized. That's what you do in your bathroom with your body, right? So you can make all your light polarized. Part, yes. So what comes out is polarized. Yeah. Then you can... Ah, uh, well... <laughs> uh, so, uh, can those uh, invisible objects uh, emit uh, radio waves and uh, how they behave? So, um, again, so in principle, yes. So you have, because what you do is you, you shrink them to the size of a point. The question is, can a point send out wave? Yes, yes it does. So an atom uh, sends out light. So in principle, you can do that. So you can also use them as you can use them as sensors, so for detecting light, and you can also use them as emitters. Actually, what I want to say, the point of sensors is that uh, you can use the if you if you use some cloaking structure around a sensor, you can limit the footprint of a sensor. So all sensors need to uh, because they attract uh, extract energy. They're distorting the electromagnetic field. But the question is how much? So how can you minimize the distortion created by a sensor? And with these cloaked structures, you can, you can do that. So you can have sensors that, that distort the field as little as possible. And then on the illumination, you could also think about whether these tricks of using materials to uh, modify the structures of space, whether you can um, you can modify the illumination patterns you do. In fact, you actually do that. So not with, with these techniques, but there are sophisticated ways of, of lightening. So these are so-called freeform lenses. So where you use uh, very strange shapes of dielectric objects in order to have uh, maximal efficiency of lighting. So, so you have an LED, which is a good approximation for a point source, and you want to make it uh, <coughs> turn it into a wide uh, into a wide beam and in a short as possible space. So for a car light, for example. And people are working on this. And the most uh, the most recent applications of this are video um, um, goggles that they're wearing. So like for um, virtual reality, where you're you, you're putting goggles on yourself and then a computer projects the image onto you. And then also the problem is how do you reduce the size of those goggles? 
and you can do this with freeform lenses. So with, with, with very uh, smartly engineered dielectric clearance dis distribution, you can uh, reduce the path needed from, from point source or near point sources to a wide beam in order to reduce the size of those bubbles, for example. Simple. Yeah, can I uh, ask one, one, one more? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so your original recipe with making things invisible by conformal transformation that creates a horizon uh, boundary between visible and invisible almost seemed to me a reminiscence of, of, of black holes where you have where you have a horizon beyond which you cannot see. And uh, well, of course, I mean you can see the black hole from the outside, so it's not it's, it's not it's not part of uh -huh. that, that story, but uh, but. It, is there other effects like at the black hole horizon in this case? Do you, uh, do you get some entanglement between inside and outside? So the inside is first, first a comment on, on, the, on the black hole. This is also related to your previous question. So the black hole is non reciprocal So because you can fall inside, but you cannot get out. And it's, I have another lecture and then mm -hmm. uh, later in the afternoon you will see why. So uh, why black holes are non visible So why they are traps? Why you can you can you can get in, but you cannot get out. However, so these uh, coordinate spatial coordinate transformations, they are reciprocal. So if you can if you can get close to the the closed structure, then um, you can also go back. And the only thing is that there's some region in space that is excluded from. And now, this is because it's simply a passive transformation of space, so all you do is you have some dielectric material, there's no reason why you get, why you get some entanglement like by light production. So they will not produce, these structures will not be able to produce light themselves, they can only, they can only uh, transform it, and they should in fact transform it in such a way that you don't, you don't see it. So that, uh, I don't think that there are source of as they are, so you need to modify them, and maybe then you, you, can, you can do that. Yeah, but if, if we wanted to use objects to mimic entanglement in black, in black holes, mm -hmm. could we do it using some non-reciprocal uh, Faraday effect? I have a lecture this afternoon about exactly this. Yeah, okay. Okay. Maybe you think we have some move to the next lecture? We'll send the speaker again.